Well, Genesis chapter 33. Two brothers are reconciled following the life of Jacob here. And a uh, uh, very uh, interesting episode is he faces his fears and uh, uh, goes out of his way to try and be reconciled to his brother. And, and uh, we'll see that the Lord has changed the heart of Esau. Uh, Jacob certainly been praying. He will make reference to, the, to his prayers, uh, dealing with his fears, uh, and obviously believes that he needs to try to do this before he goes back into what would become Israel or the land of Canaan, the land promised uh, to him by God through Abraham, then to Isaac, and now to, to Jacob. Well, let's, let's pray. Father, we, uh, as we look at this story, and it's a wonderful story of reconciliation and how you can change the heart of someone. Uh, and uh, Lord, we know that you can do that uh, in our lives and the lives of those that perhaps we need to be reconciled with as well. And so we pray that, Lord, uh, we would learn to trust you in, in that way. Pray for reconciliations of relationships and, uh, Lord, and, and see you work in our lives and in others. But, uh, Lord, it's, um, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a scary thing to watch Jacob so quickly begin to compromise his, his own relationship with you that had such a wonderful Wonderful experience, as we saw last week. Lord, humbled by you, broken by you physically, and surrendering to you. So we, Lord, just pray that we'd be able to uh, take this message to heart. You'd use it to uh, help us apply these truths to right where we're at today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, Jacob is, uh, is certainly fearful about this uh, meeting, but as we said, he doesn't have to move in the direction uh, that he's in geographically and move in the direction and send those ahead to let Esau know that he's coming, coming but he does that, and, uh, and we're going to see that encounter. And, uh, and of course, last week we saw this very important episode in the life of Jacob where uh, he basically gets alone. Uh, and in the middle of the night, a hand reaches out to grab him. He wrestles for uh, several hours, six or seven uh, hours with what he believes is a man. And it turns out later it was uh, uh, God himself wrestling with Jacob until Jacob would finally give up, in a sense, surrender his life to him and begin to believe God's goodness uh, and, and begin to uh, believe his promises and trust him. We talk about the importance that we struggle with God ourselves until we're finally broken ourselves and, and surrender to God. So the surrender to the Lord was an awesome thing. Uh, it left him with uh, the fact that he was crippled now, a constant reminder, but also left him with a, with a new name, Israel, God's fighter. He fought with God and he surrendered. And by surrendering, he won. We read a little quote from the Talmud uh, that uh, the Jewish writers there say that the name Israel is there to remind them that they ne need to learn to trust God and not themselves. And uh, <clears throat> certainly that's echoed in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. That's what Jacob's trying to do. And, and of course he has no problems after this, right? I mean, he's just trusting God every day. Uh, and that is uh, certainly a concern and why we can relate so much to uh, the story here with Jacob, because we do have those times where we really do surrender to the Lord, but then we have to get up the next day and do it again. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, in Jacob's life, the fear of his brother moves in and, well, it becomes a struggle for him. Let's take a look at uh, the first three verses it, where we'll see that he, he's uh, attempting to be reconciled to his brother. Again, we're in chapter 33 of Genesis. Now Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maid servants, and he put the maid servants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them, bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near uh, to his brother. So first thing we mentioned is uh, the obvious he's uh, uh, begins in the in this reconciliation process and the, the peculiar way that he's going to present his family. Now he kind of, he's already he kind of does the surrender to God, but he's kind of still 
you know, he's kind of hedging his bets a little bit, so he's still sending the animals on ahead. We're going to see Esau make reference to that, like, well, what's up with all, all these animals and all the gifts and so forth? So he's, he's kind of, you know, he's trusting the Lord, but, but he's going to kind of stick with his own plan as well. And uh, so the, all the animals are coming up to Esau. You know, what is this? He goes, oh, these are a gift from you, from uh, my Lord, from your servant, Jacob. And he's coming behind us. And so uh, the encounter of 550 animals at, uh, in these different groups. And then finally, he sees a group of people. And, uh, and Jacob, notice he sends the, uh, the maidservants uh, out, uh, out first, Bila and uh, Zilpah with their four boys. Dan, Naphtali, God, and, uh, and Asher. Then Leah with Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Ju uh, Judah, Ishakar, Zebulun, and their daughter Dina or Dinah. Uh, and then finally, you've got uh, Rachel and Joseph, who's probably a baby uh, at this point, coming up to the rear. And, uh, and you've got uh, you know, Esau now coming with his 400 armed men, this militia riding towards them. And I'm pretty sure the boys in the front line are probably thinking that um, I just don't think dad loves us as much as he does the guys back there. Uh, and I'm thinking that the wives are probably thinking about the same thing. And uh, this might have created just a little bit of problems in their relationships. Uh, and we'll see that in the future. Uh, Jacob creates all kinds of problems for himself. And it becomes very obvious to all of them that he esteems and loves Joseph much more than the others. Uh, and that always creates problems uh, uh, in a family. Uh, and so it's uh, very interesting the way that Jacob does this, given the fact of what we just studied, what we just read in the previous chapter. Uh, surrender to God, trusting God, but it's still hard the next day because he's still got some of those same fears uh, in his own life. He still has a tendency to go back to this default setting of, Okay, I trust God, but I'm going to kind of do this my own way. And there's a, this is going to lead to some very bad, uh, some bad things here. Uh, the second thing about the reconciliation is the way he would present himself. Verse 3, bows himself to the ground seven times. Just so you know, this is over the top. <laughs> Esau's coming, and here's this guy, and he's down, down on his face. And uh, I don't know what he was saying to himself. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. I hope this guy doesn't kill me, you know. I don't know what he was saying, is he, you know, but uh, uh, Esau probably wondered, what is the deal? That guy looks a lot like Jacob, but uh, that's not really the Jacob that uh, I knew 20 years ago. And, and remember the promise to Jacob from God back in uh, Genesis 27, 29. Let the people serve you, all nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. Actually, the opposite is happening here, isn't it? Uh, he's the one doing the bowing. There's nothing wrong with being humble, but I think part of what's going on in Jacob's mind, I think it's a struggle that we all have at times, is this idea that, is God really going to do this? Is God really that good? Is, is, because he has to realize he doesn't really deserve it. There's this issue about the four wives, the deception of his brother, the deception of his father, and all that, that... These are kind of major events that would have a tendency to kind of uh, come back to your mind uh, on occasion, uh, especially as you stare out over your 11 children and so forth. Is, uh, and would God really keep his word and really take care of him? Is he really, really trustworthy? Well, Isaiah speaks about this in his prophecy, and it's, it's a familiar verse. Let me just read it to you, uh, and we'll talk about how it's normally applied and then we'll give it in context. Isaiah 55, 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my uh, ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And we, we quote that all the time. We re read that, we hear that, and we realize, yeah, God doesn't think the way I do. I can't figure God out. His ways are different than mine, and, and I understand that. What ways exactly is Isaiah talking about here? Well, he's talking to a backslidden nation who basically are worshiping idols uh, they're not repentant. Uh, they're doing all kinds of radical things, stealing, cheating, lighting, killing. Uh, they're just uh, terrible things that are, uh, that are going on in the nation of Israel. Uh, and Isaiah is prophesying to them like Jeremiah did, like Ezekiel did that we're studying now, trying to draw people back to himself. And he's saying that you guys don't think the way I think. And, uh, and the way I think 
I realize it's beyond your comprehension. What way is that? What is it in regards to how much I love you? How much I care about you? My goodness to you? My promises to you? How much you can trust me? God says, I realize you have a hard time getting your mind around that. Because we deal with the issues of how our own shortcomings so, so often. I got a call uh, yesterday afternoon from a really good friend, an old friend that I hadn't talked to in about 12 years or, or more. And I saw him pop up on Facebook and kind of pinged him and, hey, good to see you and stuff. And so he finally, uh, we kind of uh, exchanged numbers and he called me and we talked for, you know, maybe an hour or so. And I got to kind of hear his story and what he had been doing all of these years and so involved in, in ministry at one time, a very good Bible teacher, a wonderful guy, uh, thought that he would move to the mainland, be involved in ministry, and all the things promised, all the things that were supposed to happen didn't happen. And, uh, and he was very disappointed, which went into then a bitterness, which then led to him, in a sense, well, he just walked away from fellowship, from the word, from prayer, and for everything else. Uh, very talented naval intel guy, fell back into that community and, and roamed the world for the next 10 years doing awesome things on behalf of our country. Very successful, very financially successful, uh, but uh, not walking with the Lord. And 10 years later, it's like you wake up and go, what was I thinking? A motorcycle crash? Lose your job the next day? He figured God was trying to get his attention. And uh, a broken man, like Jacob we saw last week, now trying to figure out how do you put it all back together and how did he ever lose 10 years with his family and what does he do now? But God's using him and God's blessing him and God's opening ministry opportunities for him and having a hard time. Is that really God's ways? Because his ways are so much higher. And uh, we have a hard time with that, don't we? Just accepting God's love, accepting God's goodness, especially when we don't deserve it. And uh, we're just, praise the Lord that God's not fair. <laughs> we're so thankful he is not fair. He said he is merciful. People of Israel had a hard time understanding it uh, in Isaiah's day. I think Jacob is struggling with it as well. Surrenders to the Lord. That's great, God. Thank you. But I still got to deal with this thing with my brother. I'm going to tr he's trying to do the right thing. I think his heart was filled with fear still. But notice uh, Esau's response. It comes as, uh, with a great relief to Jacob, verse 4. But Esau ran to meet him, braced him, fell on his neck, kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. And the maidservants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph, Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, these are uh, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I've seen your face, as though I'd seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. And the first thing is the response includes uh, the embrace uh, there in the meeting, verse 4. Uh, ran to him, embraced him, fell on his neck, kissed him, and so forth. And uh, no mention of the past, no mention of the deception, no mention of the, the blessing that was taken, no mention of the birthright, traded for a, a meal, uh, no mention of any, any kind of bitterness on Esau's part. God had truly changed the heart of Esau. And uh, it's so important that uh, we see that as well, that God can change the heart of uh, of others and bring reconciliation. Uh, again, back uh, just in uh, verse 32 and verse 11, we see that prayer of Jacob, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. And this is the direct answer to that prayer. But notice Esau's response included uh, the fact that he got to hear about the grace of God. Uh, Jacob mentions uh, uh, the family. He says, so who are these with you? 
uh, the children whom God has graciously given your servants, all by God's grace. Everything you see before you, I don't deserve any of this stuff. Remember Jacob's prayer, and Lord, uh, if you'll be with me and go with me and uh, just, you know, close on my back and some food, and I'm okay with that. And just get me back here again. Well, it's a lot more than that. Uh, he was doing the right thing here. That's the thing about Jacob is we see, I think we can relate to, uh, he's trying to do the right thing. Uh, it took a lot of guts, took a lot of courage to go and meet uh, Esau. Pretty freaked out when he finds out he's got an armed militia coming with him uh, and still is going to go forward with this whole thing. There's a certain amount of, well, he's not really turning his back on God. He's doing the right thing. He's speaking about God's grace. Uh, but we're going to notice, some again, some glitches in the armor here of, uh, of Jacob in a moment. But here, uh, speaking of the grace of God in terms of his family, speaking of the grace of God in terms of prayer, inasmuch as I've seen your face as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me, he said in the last half of verse 10, uh, indicates that uh, there is a connection, at least on Jacob's part, between what happened the night before in Peniel, seeing the face of God, what he went through and what he's experiencing now. What he went through and that struggle and that surrender is directly connected with what he is experiencing right now. This is the guy that I was pretty sure wanted to kill me. Instead, he's embracing me and he's, uh, he's kissing me uh, and he's hugging me. And I'm pretty sure this is all what God's done. Uh, he definitely makes that connection. And that's an important connection to make as, uh, as well. Uh, Again, it says, for I thought uh, uh, in the previous chapter that I could appease him with the presence that go ahead. And afterwards, I'll see his face. I think he realizes that the presence had very little to do with it. Uh, Esau's not going, well, you've given me a lot of stuff, so I'm going to let you off the hook and let you live. That's, that's not what we see. We see the guy run to him and grab him. Uh, almost makes us uh, think of the prodigal son. But Jacob's awareness of God and his grace is all over the passage. He makes several references to grace uh, in verse 5 and verse 8, verse 10 and verse 11. God has dealt graciously with me. I found favor in your sight to find favor or grace in the sight of my Lord uh, and so forth. Esau, nothing. <laughs> There's no mention of God. There's no mention of, of grace. Uh, can God change the heart of someone else uh, without uh, uh, bringing them to the Lord? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Who, who really surrendered before God was Jacob. Did that then have an impact on his brother, even though his brother wasn't even around him? Yeah, because Jacob's now rightly related to God. He's praying. God's answering his prayers and, and moving on his behalf, and Jacob sees that. The other thing about Esau's response in this reconciliation is I've just alluded to it came after God had changed the heart of, of Jacob, and that's the principle God will always deal with us. You want to be reconciled with somebody? Get right with God. No, it's them. They're the one with the temper. They're the one that said this. They're, no, if you want to be reconciled to that person, you get right with God. <laughs> there's, the, there's the, yeah, but if you knew my husband, Pastor, well, no, you need to get right with God. You know my wife, if she, no, you need to get right with God. That's, by the way, that's the counsel you're always going to get. You know, they're not here. You know, you're the one asking, so how are you doing? You know, you repent. Uh, you go through that struggle with the Lord. You surrender to the Lord. Then we can start to pray and anticipate that God might work in that other person's heart. You know, the Ten Commandments are, were on two tablets, and on one of them, the first, the first four, all dealt with our relationship with God. Uh, the next six on the other tablet all dealt with our relationship uh, with, with mankind. Jesus uh, said it this way in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. The first, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus said it's about getting yourself rightly related to him first so that the other relationships in your life can take care of uh, themselves. You know, we just prayed with the guys yesterday morning and, uh, in, this, in the chapel here and <clears throat> praying for uh, uh, a marriage uh, a situation. And, uh, and again, what we're praying foremost is for them to get right with the Lord so that God can work in the marriage. And, uh, and that is the, the sequence of events. 
Now, we do have this little thing about the refusal uh, to accept J uh, Jacob's, uh, again, very, very generous uh, gifts here. And, uh, and it would appear, it would appear that Esau is, you know, he's like, no, 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 I'm not going to take all this stuff. You know, you keep it yourself. I got plenty. Uh, and Jacob has to insist that he takes it, and then he does, and that's just Middle Eastern etiquette. <laughs> he's going to take... He's going to take the gifts, but he's got to do the refusal first. Oh, no, 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 I don't really need it. And, of course, then Jacob has to, no, no, if it pleases my Lord, and, you know, if I found favor in your sight. And so he's got to go through this, uh, this whole thing. And uh, it's the same way in the Middle East today. It's the same way in a lot of uh, Asian cultures, not all of them, of course, but some, you know, that uh, one of the places we visit, if... Uh, somebody invites you for dinner, it doesn't really mean they want you to come for dinner. It's just, uh, you know, a thing to say, oh, it's so nice to see you. You should come over for dinner sometime. You know, if you want to do the dumb American thing, you go, okay, we'll be there at seven, you know, <laughs> which you're going to see a very shock, you know, expression on their face <clears throat> because, uh, you know, you're supposed to then say, oh, no, 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 we're so busy. That's very kind of you. And maybe sometime, and we definitely should do that. And, uh, and you've just expressed a little short kindness and gesture one to another. Now, if they come back again and say, uh, uh, oh, no, no, we, I, you know, this would be really great. My wife's expecting you. And, oh, that's so kind of you. And, now, that doesn't, still doesn't mean they want you to come. But if they do it a third or a fourth time, they actually really want you to come for dinner. And then it's okay to say, yeah, we would love to, uh, to be there. So that's all that's going on here. Uh, Jacob does the right thing. He insists that uh, Esau take the gifts, uh, and he does. So uh, Jacob's uh, attempt to be reconciled uh, with his brother, uh, he's, uh, he's to some degree, he's trusting the Lord. He's had that experience with him. At the same time, he still sends the animals. He still <laughs> divides his family into these groups. He still bows down seven times to get there, uh, and he's still struggling with fear. And, uh, and we're going to see that that doesn't go away even after this incident and it leads to some terrible compromise uh, in his life. The response certainly comes with a great relief because God's answered his prayer. He, to his credit, has testified about the, the grace of God in his life, uh, which is a, a wonderful thing. Uh, and now we have to deal with Jacob and his finding a way to pol politely refuse to follow his brother. Notice verse 12. Then Esau said, let us take our journey. Let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me. And if men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that goes before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and see her. And uh, Esau said, now let me leave with you <clears throat> some of the people, these are men who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. <clears throat> so Jacob refuses to travel to uh, Seir. Where is Jacob supposed to be going? Canaan, the promised land. Remember, that was the deal, right? God's going to go with them. God's going to take care of them. God's going to bring them back. He's supposed to come back to, to uh, Israel, to the land of Israel. Uh, where, does, uh, where does Esau live? Uh, Esau lives in the rock city of Petra. He lives way down in southern Jordan, not exactly on the way. Now, Jacob's gone out of his way so that he can have this reconciliation and everything. Again, he's doing the right thing here, just not doing it in the right way. Uh, and really what he's doing is he's offering lame excuses and outright lies. Uh, notice, uh, again, the idea uh, in verse 13. Uh, My Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and herds are nursing with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die? I don't think so. You're going to tell me you've got <laughs> hundreds of goats and sheep and... Uh, and so forth. And if you drive them hard one day, they're all just going to drop dead at the end of the day. I, I don't think so. A little, little bit of an exaggeration here. Uh, he knows that he shouldn't be going with them. He knows it would be dangerous to go with them. So he gives just, it's not an outright lie, it's just kind of an, a bit of an exaggeration. All the flock will die. Really? 
And then he moves from that to outright deceit in verse 14. Please let my Lord go ahead of me before a servant. I'll lead on slowly. Really? No, he's not going to lead on. You go right ahead. We're right behind you, at least for the first mile. And then he's going to turn around and go in the opposite direction, as we'll see. But uh, notice he says, until I come to my Lord and seer. Uh, maybe like in a few months or next year or sometime, I'm not really sure. So he, he has no intent of going to southern Jordan at this point. Why, why doesn't he just tell his brother? Well, he's just trying to be gracious. No, he's lying to him. And I think he's still afraid. You know, he goes from one moment of testifying of God's goodness and his grace to his brother saying, well, why don't you just come with me to our place? Why not just say, well, I would like to, but I'm following the Lord. And so, and the Lord is, gonna, is directing me over, over here. You know, there's a whole issue about that blessing thing. You remember, and dad, the blessing. Well, that's where I need to go. I understand that this is your place, but I need to go over here. Hey, can you come to that party on Friday night? We'd love to have you. Well, you know, I'd like to, but you know, there's going to be a, a lot of drinking going on. And, you know, we, we're following the Lord. Or is it, you know, that sounds great. You know, I'll, I'll check and get back. We're kind of busy, though. I'll... What, do, what do we do? I mean, do we just really tell people we're following the Lord? And there's a reason why we make decisions the way that we do? We're not trying to beat somebody over the head with it, but are we compromising a little? Is, is, is that a wrong thing? Just to kind of, you don't want to hurt their feelings? Well, look what happens to Jacob. It goes from this exaggeration to, uh, to an actual lie. He has no intention. And where does he go? He goes to Sukkoth. Where is that? In the opposite direction. Is that where God wants him to go? No, he went back north. He was going south. And I'll show you a map here in a moment. Uh, to show you where he should have been going. He goes back north, the opposite direction of Esau, to get away from him, uh, and he travels back up and crosses the Jabbok River, which is the tributary running into the Jordan, but he's not crossing the Jordan going into the promised land where God intended him to be. Uh, he's still running. Is he just hanging out there for a few days? No, he builds a house in the, the booths, the places for his animals. He's going to stay there for a while, uh, not in a place where God wants him to be. There's some compromises that are beginning to happen in Jacob's life, and it's happening pretty quickly. Let's go on and we'll, we'll get him into the promised land uh, here anyway. As he reaches the promised land, that's verse 18 to 20. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. And he brought the par bought the parcel of land, which he had pitched uh, where he pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's, uh, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces uh, of money. Then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohe Israel. So Jacob reaches the promised land. That's good. And he settles near Shechem. Now, here's the, the map. And uh, it's, you know, from our perspective, it's sideway. North is this way. That's the, the blue at the top is the Mediterranean. That's the, uh, the Dead Sea, the top of it, the bottom. The point is, you see Shechem up there, and you see the arrow go down, uh, and there's Bethel. There's where God wanted him to be. He's 20, he's 25 miles away. It's topographical. You can notice that going up towards Shechem, uh, he has to cross some pretty rocky, hilly area, and he's going into uh, a very rocky, hilly area, a place Esau probably wouldn't follow him to. He's still fearful. He's still on the run. God says, go here. He says, I will. I'll return. I'll go to Bethel. And then he gets into the land and goes, I think I'll go here instead. I'm in the land. I'm kind of in the, I'm in the land. I'm just not exactly where God wanted me to be. And uh, as we get to the next chapter, there's some horrible things that happen. Right? His daughter's raped. Older sons get a little ticked off about that. They come up with a plan so they can go and commit genocide. Now he's got half the country after him wanting to kill him. And if God doesn't put his, the fear of, of Jacob into the hearts of those people, they're all dead. It's, it's a scary thing when we begin to compromise a little bit. Is God still going to watch over him? Yep. God's still going to keep his promises to him? Yep. Jacob's still going to have a hard time getting his mind around God's grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his goodness. He's still going to have a hard time with that. 
It's true, but he's going to have a hard time with it. <clears throat> he settles near Shechem. Uh, we would say this is halfway in be obedience, therefore it's disobedience. Uh, one writer said, did Jacob think that Shechem was a better site for trade and for his flocks? Perhaps he thought it didn't matter. After all, Bethel was now a mere 20 miles or so away, and he could go there whenever it suited him. You know, once he got settled, why be so precise about things? Shechem, Bethel, it's really all the same isn't it? We don't know if that's what, was, uh, what he was thinking, but we do understand the idea of compromise and then rationalization. And I'm sure there was a lot of rationalization uh, going on. We know that it would cost him dearly. The next thing about this reaching the promised land is, well, he does a good thing here. He does a religious thing. He builds an altar, calls it El, Elohe Israel, the God, the God of Israel. And, uh, and he he celebrates and he worships there. Now, it's interesting because his grandfather, I'm sure he knows the story, Abraham built an altar there as well. What was the next episode in the life of Abraham? A drought came, he compromised and went to Egypt. And his nephew Lot paid the price for it later. It's actually a place where his, well, the same thing happened to him there. It's still not where God wanted him to be. Well, what was the promise? What was the conversation he had with the Lord when he started out back in uh, Genesis 28, 18? There it says there, Then Jacob uh, rose early in the morning and took the stone he had put uh, at his head, and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city had been loose previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. In this stone which I set as a pillar shall be God's house. In all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So we'd certainly say that he reached the promised land, but unfortunately doesn't reach uh, Bethel. El Elohel, Israel. Well, he was... Uh, uh, Jacob's uh, mighty God, and he was God's, uh, God's fighter, uh, but he's going to learn obedience uh, the hard way. If you go on into chapter 35, verse 1, you'll see, see there that God speaks to him, uh, and God redirects his life at that point and tells him, uh, as it says, arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And he does. But what happens in, ch in, in the chapter 34, again, is a, is a tremendous tragedy. Remember the story of, uh, of Moses as he's leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the bondage. They go through the, the Red Sea. It collapses on Pharaoh and, uh, and his armies, and they are truly set free. They move out into the Sinai Desert. But, of course, there's tremendous needs when you've got a few million people and you're uh, moving through an, uh, an arid area. There's a point in time when the people begin to complain about the lack of water. Moses uh, intercedes with God. God says, go to the rock, strike the rock, and out of it will flow water. Moses does. Think about the water, water for a couple of million people. This isn't like a little, this is like a gushing torrent river. Probably creates a bit of a lake out there in the middle of, uh, uh, of nowhere. A uh, uh, tremendous miracle. And then you remember there's a second time when the people are complaining at a, uh, and another occasion, and God says to Moses, this time just speak to the rock, and out of it will flow the water. And you remember that uh, Moses, in his anger, strikes the rock, and God says, that's not good enough. No water until you do it my way. That's not what happened, isn't it? The water came out, and uh, it was a successful ministry. It sure seemed like God was in it. The water came out. It was a miracle. All the people had their water. Uh, but Moses had, well, he had, he'd kind of, he went to the rock. I mean, he was kind of obedient to the Lord. And, uh, and certainly the blessings of God sure seemed to be upon them in his ministry at that point. But he'd actually compromised, hadn't he? He hadn't really been disobedient. God had told him to speak to the rock. But in reality, then God tells Moses, you're not able to go in the promised land because you didn't do what I asked you to do. God was blessing and does bless, not because of us, despite us. And sometimes we can roll along in life and we see God's blessing and we think we're all good. 
<laughs> Even though there's been the slight exaggeration, there's been the, that led to now I have to tell a lie to cover the exaggeration. Uh, that's because I don't want to really say that I'm walking with God now. I'm following God. I'm committed to God. I'm trusting God because I've got my own issues and there's some things I'm legitimately fearful of and after all, and I've got a plan and I've got to do and well, I still am worshiping God. That's not the issue. And we become like, like Jacob and you just kind of move further and further away. I can tell you how heart-wrenching it was to hear from my friend and all the things that ensued and some very tragic things over, over 10 years of being away from the Lord. Uh, it's a hard thing. God take us back? Absolutely. Forgive us? 100%. But uh, man, the compromises, the things that happen in our lives, it's a terrible thing. Self-sufficient Jacob. Well, he was surrendered at one time. He had wrestled with God at Peniel, but, uh, and that's when he was at his best. You know, at the weakest point in his life is when he was at his best. But almost immediately, he retreated from humility and dependence on the Lord. Uh, noted he lied to his godless, big-hearted brother, tarried at Sukkoth instead of entering the promised land. When he did enter, it was through partial obedience. He builds an altar at Shechem. That's, that's kind of a good thing. Uh, but again, wrong place and uh, worshiping at an altar that he had never bent his knee to. The idea of surrendering to the Lord. And we're going to see that, uh, again, things will get worse for Jacob before they get better. All to say that we're, we're always a lot better when we're when in our weakest state, when we're humble before the Lord. The toughest times are the times when we're actually the most successful. Uh, when things are going the best for us, is, uh, is sometimes when the greatest temptations come. The Apostle Paul knew it, and he said it this way in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, of God speaking to him, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities or weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I will take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches in deeds and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Kind of the opposite of the world, isn't it? In the world, it's when you're strong, is, that's pretty much when you're strong, when you've got the power, when you're the one in charge. You know, but in our relationship with the Lord, it's the opposite. We're at our best when we're at our weakest moment, when we've we got nothing left except to trust God. And the challenge is, as God blesses, and he does, to keep trusting him. I don't know if he has to take a hip out of joint. <laughs> but, uh, man, we need to keep walking with the Lord and trusting him. Jacob didn't have the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in him. He didn't have the, the, uh, the written word that we have. He didn't have all the things that we have uh, uh, to us. He's not under the new covenant that we are under, that we're about to uh, celebrate and remember in communion in just a moment. But uh, we sure can relate to him, can't we? And, uh, and we want to heed the warning and look at their lives and, and, uh, and remember them. Well, let's pray.